If anyone ever misses an appointment, this is the appointment they miss. Because they've had deliverance and they feel so good that they think, I don't need any more. When, in fact, this service tonight, or this session tonight, is the most important of all. Because, you see, it's one thing to get free. It's absolutely altogether something different to stay free. So this is very, very important what you're hearing. Um, after you were born again, um, what did the devil come and say to you? Oh, it really didn't take. You're really not born again. If you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, what did the devil come and say to you right afterward? He said, that's not you. That's just a bunch of gibberish. Well, guess what? After deliverance, what do you think he's going to come and say to you? He's going to say, you didn't really get delivered. I'm still here. Because it works so many times. He, you know, he's gonna, there's a certain percent of the times it works, so he's just going to keep hitting people right there. So if it hasn't happened to you yet, it will. Just expect it. He's going to come and say, you didn't really get deliverance. I'm still around. Now, in your workbook, I can't remember the page, but there's some prayers in there. There's a daily warfare prayer and there's the evening warfare prayer. It's going to be during uh, somewhere um, in the first section. 11? Page, page 11? Uh, she said, look on page 11 and see. These prayers are so very important. And it's not that we want you to pray our prayer. That's not it at all. It's just a guideline for you to pray your own. But most people pray. They beseech God. God would you please take care of my children and don't let this happen to my workers? And it's beseeching God for something. But a warfare prayer comes in three parts. First, you're beseeching God the way you always pray. And the second part of the prayer is you're telling the devil what he can do and can't do in your life and your children's life. And then the third part of the prayer is you're dispatching angels or you're asking God to dispatch angels to hold back the forces of Satan and his kingdom so that the things that you ask for in the first part of the prayer when you're beseeching God will come to pass. Now, when you're praying to God, you can pray any way you want to. You don't have to say it out loud. You don't even have to say it right because God knows everything. But when you're talking to the devil, he is a legalist. And if you don't see it right, he'll laugh right in your face. So we try to design this prayer so that it's legal. You know, if you buy a piece of property, you want your deed to be able to stand up in court. Well, it's the same when you're talking to the devil. You need to say it right that he has to abide by what you say. One time I, I pray in the morning and I walk. And uh, I was walking and praying and I, I was saying, to, uh, you know, I was telling the devil, my husband's a general contractor in the morning. We do counseling in the afternoon and we do uh, services like this in the evening. But in the morning he's a general contractor. So he has jobs that he's working on. And I was praying, and I said, uh, Satan, you can't touch our employees. You can't cause any accidents. You can't uh, cause any spills. So these kind of things. And, and uh, the Lord stopped me, and he said, don't say that anymore. I said, what do you mean, don't say that anymore? He said, they are not your employees. They are subcontractors, and they work for themselves. They're not on our payroll. Now, do you see, by him telling me that, it was like click, click, click. Yeah, you better say it right when you're talking to the devil. So that's, if you look over the prayer, you'll see that that's how we designed it. And it will really, really help you. Now, we have um, a Satanist lady that came in to us. And um, she made this statement. You Christians... 
don't cover yourself enough when you go to bed at night because we can astral project right into your bedroom while you're sleeping. When she told us that, that's when we designed the evening warfare prayer. Well, we do. I mean, Paul and I wouldn't even think about going to bed at night without doing this. When we lay our heads down on those pillows, we're saying uh, we drive out any astral projection spirit, any soul travel spirit, any demonic spirit that could be there because you don't know who comes in and out of your house. And then we cover our house with the blood of Jesus. We cover the room we're in, top, bottom, and all sides. And then we dispatch angels, mighty warring angels to stand there and to hold back the forces of Satan and his kingdom while we sleep. And we go to bed and sleep like a baby. If you're having problems sleeping at night, try that. It'll probably take you not even a minute to say it. It doesn't take any. You see, it's just a little short prayer. But it's, it, it's very important to do that. It warfare prayer uh, when you go to bed at night. There's also in your book, and I'm not sure the page I should write these down, there's uh, some scriptures, and I think it's in the fourth section. Uh, and they're just great scriptures for you to read after deliverance. Really good scriptures. If you're husband and wife, you might want to, you know, before you go to bed at night, just go over. Um, maybe one can read one one night and one the next. Um, it, it's great scriptures. So if you will get into that, it will really help. Now then, after, did you find the page number, anyone? The scriptures? Section 4, I think it would be in Section 4. It's a handout that we give people uh, after the deliverance. Forty, how to stay free. Okay, and there's scriptures on there. Is that right? Well, y'all can go home and just look for them tonight. How's that? All right, now, after deliverance, what page? Y'all hear that? 20, 24. Okay, now, after deliverance, it's like the ball is in your park now. We've done all we know to do. We've gone through the teachings, and we've prayed deliverance. But now it's up to you. And there comes a time when you have to put your own finger in the devil's face and say, no, I already had you. I know what you feel like, and I don't like you. And whatever left you is probably going to be the same thing that tries to come back. If you had rejection, and you know what it feels like, it's an ugly, ugly feeling. It's an ugly spirit. And when that person calls you up on the phone to put some rejection on you, it's like, come on, devil. Is that your, really your best shot? I'm not going to fall for that. I'm not going to let you in here. See, you're ready for it. You, don't, you know what it is when it comes because you know what it felt like. I'm going to give you a couple little stories. After deliverance, a lot of things that are happening to you is just happening out of habit. I'll give you an example. Let's say that you were delivered here this uh, on this Saturday of a spirit of profanity. You cussed, said a lot of cursing words. Okay, the next day after deliverance, wow, boom, all this filthy stuff comes out of your mouth and you say, oh, I let the devil back in and now he's going to come back seven times worse and you get all nervous and upset about it when actually maybe for the last 20 years you've been punctuating your sentences with swear words. So it just habit. It's not that that spirit is there driving you to talk that way. It's just habit. Now, let's uh, say you're married and you got uh, delivered from a huge spirit of rejection. 
Now, before you got deliverance, every time your husband would come in the house, if he wouldn't come over and give you a big hug and a kiss, well, you're all huffy puffy. And you know how women can be, how you kind of don't talk to your husband, kind of cold, all that. And it's because that spirit inside of you has been telling you, he doesn't love you. If he loved you, he would uh, uh, recognize you when he came into the house, acknowledge you, and come over and hug and kiss you. See, the spirit was telling you that. But after deliverance, your husband could come home and not come over and kiss you, and boom, you're all huffy puffy again. Because you see, that's what you've been doing for the last 20 years. It doesn't mean the spirit is there. You are just reacting the same way you've always reacted. And in about a week or maybe nine days, ten days, maybe even two weeks, all of a sudden, one day, it's going to be like he comes in, he doesn't kiss you, and you think, ah, who cares? I mean, who really cares? Because you don't have that spirit in you anymore telling you that he doesn't love you if he doesn't come kiss you. So a lot of things, again, is just habit. My, uh, my youngest son, he's, oh, he's six foot five right now. But way back when he was five years old, he had a spirit of fear that was gigantic. He was, he was so frightened, he would not go to the bathroom in the daytime without having me come and stand on the other side of the door. He had to have his light on every night, and he wouldn't even think of coming into a house if no one was in that house. And I knew there was a problem, but I didn't know anything at all about spiritual warfare. So I went to this lady in my church, and I said, my son's got a problem. Would you come pray for him? Now, this was a Korean lady. And I don't know if you know anything about Korean people, but they know how to pray, and they can touch God. You know, over at Brother, uh, what is it, Cho? Cho's church over there in Seoul, Korea, the biggest church in the world, they go up on Prayer Mountain and stay there praying the whole weekend. These people can pray, and I picked the right lady. She came over to my house at 7 o'clock, and she started praying over Josh. Well, at 9 o'clock, he fell asleep on the couch, and she just kept praying. She didn't leave till 2 in the morning. She prayed over my whole house. She prayed over the drawers and and the closets and the clothes. This lady prayed down heaven. And when she left at 2 in the morning, I knew there was no spirit of fear in my house. I knew there was no spirit of fear or any kind of spirit within five miles of my house. But the next morning, Josh woke up. Mom had to go to the bathroom. And I'm laughing on the inside as I go stand at that door because I know there's no spirit there. But I'm thinking, I wonder how long it's going to take before Josh realizes the spirit isn't there. And I counted the days. It took nine days. On the ninth day, he went to the bathroom by himself. Never had to have the light on again. And if he got home from school before his brother and I got there, he went right on into the house. You see, the spirit was gone on day one, but he didn't have the realization of it until day nine. And that could happen to you. Uh, that's why we like to have this, this appointment with you a week or so after deliverance, because by then you've experienced some of these things maybe in your own life. Another story is about a girl named Phyllis, and she gave me permission to give her testimony. She used to work uh, on staff at the same church where we were, and she had a huge spirit of fear. Usually, a spirit of fear will manifest like this. It won't look at you, and it'll kind of hold itself together, but not hers. This spirit of fear in her just, went rampant. We were in the pastor's uh, office, and I thought the spirit was going to absolutely destroy his whole office. And she was a pretty good-sized girl, and Pa ended up, he was sitting on her on the floor to try to contain her. I mean, she had a spirit of fear like you wouldn't believe. But it left her, 
And this woman got gloriously set free. Now everything's fine. Everything goes on for about six months. Now she has to go in the hospital for some surgery, and it's to the back of her neck. Now to get there, you have to cut here, and it is major. And this lady, I mean, she's spiritually, she's mentally, and she's physically ready for this surgery. In fact, she went to Rodney Hard Brown's when he was over at Carpenter's Home Church about 10 years ago. Remember when he was just getting started and there was a big move of the spirit at those meetings over there? Well, she had gone over there the night before, surgery. Now, she's really, really ready. Now, think about it for a minute. If you were a spirit of fear and you didn't have a body to live in, where would you hang out? Trauma centers, hospitals. Has anyone in this room ever gone to a hospital and felt good about it? Have you ever walked down the corridor of a hospital and you could just feel, ooh, it's, it's spirits of fear, infirmity, death. All of these spirits are, are, are in the hospital, and that's why we usually don't like to go there because you're, spiritually you're picking up on all of this stuff. Well, here she is. She's in the hospital ready for the surgery, and the nurse comes and said, Well, Phyllis, I have some sad news for you. Your doctor just called, and he's going to be 45 minutes late. And she said, fear gripped her. She said, I got so scared, I pulled the blankets up over my head. And I'm laying there almost shaking under the blankets. And she said, in my spiritual eye, my spiritual eyes could see, way up in this corner of the room, there was a black cloud. And she said, it was moving very, very slowly, but it was coming toward me. And she said it was just coming and coming and coming. And she said, I knew within seconds that thing was going to be all over me. And I threw the covers back and I pointed my finger and I said, Fear, I know you. And Fear, you know me and you know the God I serve. Now you get out of my face. Boom, it left that fact. After deliverance, you have to do that sometimes. You have to get your finger in the devil's face and say, no, get out of here. You see, Phyllis had been sexually abused by her father all her life. She never told anyone until she was 13. She lived in fear. She knew what fear felt like, and she felt this thing coming at her, and she knew it was fear. Well, when this thing starts coming at you, you know what it felt like. You know what you got delivered of. And when it does, you say, mm -mm, no, no, I'm not going to go along with your program. After deliverance, it's like you have a big bird's nest up here on your head. Now, that's the bird's home. And they're going to try to get back. And when they do, you go, See, you're shooing them off. And you're persistent, and you just keep doing that. And those devils aren't stupid. They're going to get together and say, you know what? I don't think we're going to get back in our house. We better just go build a new house somewhere else. It's your persistent, no, 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 I'm not going to have you back in my life. Now, what Paul and I do is... We analyze our thoughts. Did you know a thought doesn't have to be bad to come from the devil? How many of you have ever started to pray and you have 3,000 thoughts? I got to go pick up the kids. I got to wash my hair. I got to do the dishes. I got to make this phone call. Now, those aren't bad thoughts, but they're not from God. And they're not from you because you're wanting to pray to God. You're wanting to talk to God, and he's wanting to talk back to you. So what do you think these thoughts are? What we do is we take the thought, cover it with the blood of Jesus, and give it right back to the devil. You know, the blood is the one thing that destroyed his kingdom 2,000 years ago. 
And we like Christians, it's like we have this big bazooka gun, but we don't ever use it. It is the most powerful thing. It is our greatest tool, the blood of Jesus. Now, I'm kind of visual, and I can picture this scene. Let's say it's wherever the big guys are giving out the orders to the little demon imps or whatever you call them on a daily basis. Okay. Now, we got this big guy, and he's, and he's giving out the orders, and he's saying, Now, listen here. I told you to put some fear on Emily yesterday, and it didn't work. So today, I want you to put rejection on her, and it better work today. Do you hear me? And this little imp is saying, Oh, don't choose me. Don't choose me. Choose him. Choose him. Because she fights with the blood. That's just my picture of it, but I believe it's true. They don't want to mess with you when you're using the blood of Jesus. Now then, in um, James 1.12, it talks about a crown. There are several places in Scripture that talks about a crown. One of them we're all going to receive because it's for looking forward to his coming. One crown you have to die to get. It's a martyr's crown. But in James 1.12, it talks about a crown that you can receive for overcoming temptation. Let's say that uh, you came in on Saturday and you smoked cigarettes and you were very, very addicted. You had an addictive spirit to nicotine. You came in and you got deliverance. Well, the next day you're sitting eating a big meal. You just finished up. Oh, my, that's when you always had a cigarette, and the temptation is just so great. And you think it over, and you say, No, thank you, devil. I don't think so, but I'll take a crown instead. And you take your crown, and you put it down over here. Later that day, here comes this temptation again. You think it over. No, thank you, devil. But I'll take a crown instead. And you put your crown down here. Now, only a human can have a crown. And one day, that's all that we're we're going to have to lay at Jesus' feet. Devils can't have crowns. Again, they're not stupid. They're going to get together and they're going to say, you know what? I think we're doing Emily more good than we are harm by putting all this temptation on her. And they'll back off. See, it's your persistence. You just got to be persistent when it comes to the devil. It's like this is God and this is you. And as long as you're in the center of God's will, you are so safe. Nothing's going to touch you. But when you decide to sin, boop, 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 boop. you go out here and open sin. Look, you're the target for every demon there is. Your only safe place is right back here in the center of God's will. In that uh, prayer that you have in your book, somewhere in that prayer, there's going to be a statement that says, show me Satan's tactics in advance. You need to say it every day because every day is new. Because there are people putting curses out against you. uh, They have a plan for your life every day of your life. And God knows what that plan is. He knows everything. You just say, show me Satan's tactics in advance. And he will. I mean that you'll be going along that day and something will happen and it'll be like, bing! Oh, that's the devil. I'll tell you another little story. Uh, I do not much anymore, but I used to really be into doing group uh, medical insurance. And I was working on a lot of groups and, and everybody's different and they all have different things, you know, different, some maternity benefits and some different deductibles, all of this. And 
I really wanted to make a good presentation, and because I'm working on several at one time, I wanted to have all my ducks in a row. So I worked on this all morning, got all dressed up, went to my appointment, and I am so fresh, and I am so ready. And the secretary said, oh, I forgot to tell um, the uh, uh, president about your appointment. Now I was upset. Now, Paul, that morning, had gone to a, a construction place or whatever. He had gone to some kind of shop to get something. And when he went in, there was a man in there that owed us about $3,000. And that reminded him of it. And when the man saw Paul, he left all of his change and slipped out the side door. Now, we meet for lunch, and we're both mad. Okay. We're both all really ticked off. And so, um, but I have to back up the story. The day before, we're ministering, uh, and we were doing about uh, seven po appointments a day, just back to back. As soon as one would leave, somebody else is waiting out in the hallway. And we're in ministering with someone, and this man comes pounding on our door. So I went out, and it was someone that we had been seeing, and he said, you got to help me, you got to help me, you got to see me right now. I know I'm going to kill my family. And we're book, booked up solid, all these people out there waiting. And I said, well, I tell you what, come tomorrow at 4 o'clock, but don't go home tonight. Go sleep at your sister's house. Just don't go home and come in tomorrow at 4. Now, the day, the morning that we are both ticked off is the same day that we're going to see him at 4. So Paul and I go over to the Burger King to have uh, lunch, and we're sitting there, and he's telling me, oh, you know what this, and I'm saying, oh, you know what it, and we're, we're, we're kind of griping together, and it was like, bing, oh, this is the devil. And so we start praying, I deliberately choose to forgive, and you know, uh, and we just forgot the whole thing, we prayed about it, and everything was fine. Now the man comes in at 4 o'clock. And he had so much revenge and retaliation, you just can't even anger. All of those things under the jealousy category. Now, I'm standing behind the man. Paul's in front of the man, and I have my hands on his shoulders. Well, the demon inside of him reached over to bite me. And so I moved my hands back. And Paul said, in the name of Jesus, you're not going to hurt her. So the demon in him grabbed his shirt with its teeth. And tore his shirt to pieces. When this man left, there was shirt all over our floor. He just had little stringlets of shirt left on. And But you see, the devil wanted to have me and Paul angry when we pray for an angry person. You need to say that prayer. Show me. Satan's tactics in advance. One more little tip, and then Paul's um, got something for you. Don't ever go to bed angry. I don't care who did what to you. I don't care who said what to you. You lay your head on that pillow, and you say, I deliberately choose to forgive Mary and Bill and Susie and Joe. I don't care how I feel. I'm not trusting in my feelings. I deliberately choose to forgive. Because I'll tell you, if you go to bed mad at someone, that see, Satan doesn't come in like a flood. All he's looking for is a teeny tiny little seed, just a little nick in your armor. If he can get that little seed in, when you went to bed, overnight it will sprout and get little roots. By morning time, you won't want to forgive anybody. And I can tell you what the devil's got set up for you the next day. About ten things to make you angry. Someone's going to cut you off in traffic. Someone's going to call you up and make you mad. Someone's going to snub you at the store. You see, because he got the little seed there, he's going to water it and fertilize it and cultivate it. You can trust that he will do that. So just don't give him an inch. You know, if you shake hands with the devil, he will bite your arm off. 
way he works. I want to give you a little scripture here that I think really really tells the story of how the enemy tries to work. It's uh, Jesus telling this story. It's in Luke chapter 11, verse 24, and 25, and 26. It says, when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places to seek rest. And finding none, he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put into order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Now that scripture is what Jesus is talking about, that when a spirit does leave, that same spirit will try to come back. The reason why we have people do their homework prior to deliverance is so that they cannot come back. If there is an open door that has not been dealt with, then that spirit may have a right to come back. But if you have forgiven those people that trespassed against you, you release the judgments against them, you renounce the things that you've done in the occult and everything that you've, we've asked you to do on that, on that list, not only does it make your, make your deliverance go much smoother, but they don't have a right to come back to you. And, uh, and so, you know, then you fill your spirit here. You fill your life with the Word of God. You fill it with the worship of the Lord. And uh, your house is not clean and garnished. It's filled with the Holy Ghost. And so, uh, you, so that they really cannot come back. And sometimes people will take the Scripture and say, oh, I don't want deliverance because I'm afraid I'll just let them all back in again. Well, uh, like Claire was saying, uh, you know, if you want to go out into sin, yes, you can do that. But if you live a life like God wants you to live a life, then uh, they cannot come back and torment your life like, uh, like the enemy tries to tell you he can, see? And so this is a trick of the enemy. He'll, he'll try to tell you anything that he can to get you to become so that you won't get set free. And so, uh, but after deliverance, now, some of you, and practically I would say most of you, I would think, has experienced uh, a lot more clarity in your mind, a lot more freedom, and just uh, you just feel you just feel so much better than what you felt before. You might before you felt like you were just carrying a bunch of baggage around, you know, all the time, but now that baggage has disappeared, and so so it's it's a it's a feeling to feel uh, you just feel free. And that's, uh, that's what we call freedom and uh, when you go through deliverance. But, but you see, they do try to come back. And they'll try to come back through your thought life. This is what Claire was saying, too. They will come back as a thought. It doesn't come back as an inner drive inside of you, but uh, it will put thoughts up here. You see, even after deliverance, the enemy still can put a thought here. They put thoughts here all the time. But you see, you have more sensitivity now, more awareness of those thoughts, and you recognize, well, hey, those aren't my thoughts. And those thoughts certainly didn't come from God. So I know, devil, that's you that that thought came from, and I take authority over that thought, and I bind it up in Jesus' name. Now you just take it back. I'm not going to receive it. And you know what? The thought disappears just like that. That don't make any difference what it is. It just disappears. And so all at once you begin to say, wow, you know, that really works, see? And now you're learning spiritual warfare. And so warfare is something that a Christian should really understand. You know, when, uh, when a person goes through deliverance, it's, just like, it's like a healing takes place. It heals the emotions. It heals all these inner feelings and things that you've had throughout the past years because of uh, situations and things that's happened to you. But now you've, you've come to a healing process, and now you are becoming a warrior for the Lord. Now you are ready to be on the front lines. You see what I'm saying? It's not a time for you to go back and relax and, and just get, uh, get relaxed and say, I've gone through deliverance, praise God. I can just now just sit back and just relax, and, uh, and I'm on my way to heaven. Now, that's not what God wants you to do. He wants you to be right there so that you can come against the demonic kingdom 
And, and if you don't need help, he's going to send somebody in your path that you can help them. You see what I'm saying? I remember uh, last week we had the school of deliverance at, uh, over to the ministry building. And uh, we had a couple that came up from uh, Brandon that had been in the, been in the ministry, uh, particularly the, uh, the wife had been in, uh, been in ministry most of her life. But... Uh, uh, as a Christian, but never really had gotten into any type of a warfare. And about the third day or the fourth day into the school of deliverance, she uh, had a situ- ran into a situation with her sister, and uh, she said, for the first time in my life, I felt like I had authority to come against what was attacking her, you see. And so God used her to help her sister, you see. And so that's what God's going to begin to happen in your life. You're going to see that things are going to be coming in front of you. And so all at once, God's going to put you in a position to where you're going to have to go into warfare for that person. And you start taking authority over the attack of that spirit that's attacking your family, attacking your children, or attacking that friend that lives down the street from you. And so that they, they may not know how to do that, but God's going to put you in your path. In, their, your path, he's going to, in your path so that you can do warfare, all right? And so it's, uh, so it's how God wants us to be, I believe, as Christians, is to do and be very productive and be uh, offensive now. And it's trying to be, instead of being defensive, now we're on the offense, amen? Now, let me give you another scripture. It says 2 Corinthians, uh, it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3, 4, and 5. It says, for we walk in the flesh... We do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they are not physical, but they are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now that last scripture, that last line there is saying that it is possible to have complete obedience. We can do that, all right? And, but you see what this scripture is saying, that when, even though we're walking in the flesh, we don't operate in the flesh. Because... Your weapons are not physical. Your weapons are mighty through God. They are spiritual. And so what you have to understand is you begin now to fight things in the spirit realm. You don't fight them in the physical. You got a rebellious teenager, what do you do? You don't beat the devil out of them. You can't do it. It's too late. All right? But you can bind up the spirit in them. You can start fighting it in the spirit realm. And taking authority over that. You've got children that are unsaved. Once you start binding up those hindering spirits in them. Start binding them up in Jesus' name. Say, Satan, you can't have my children. You don't have a right to my children. I'm a child of God. And you will not have my children in Jesus' name. I bind you in Jesus' name. And I said, you will not have my children. And you start coming against the devil. And you bind up those hindering spirits in your children. I'm going to tell you what. You're going to find all at once the convicting power of God's going to come on them. And uh, they're going to give their life to the Lord. That's what Norval Hayes did. He prayed like that for his daughter. She was on drugs, living in sin. He did that for about four years. And uh, he didn't give up. And the angel showed up to the foot of her bed one morning. Scared the devil right out of her. And uh, she got born again. Amen? And so I tell you, your prayers will work if you, if you make them happen. And, uh, and so it's just the fact that you need to understand that you can fight it in the spirit realm. Now, you see, the enemy will try to come back. And he will come back through your thought life. If you had a spirit, like Claire was mentioned, of uh, an addiction... That same spirit that left you is the same spirit that's going to try to find the door back into your life because it's used to you, all right? It's familiar with you. And so if it was nicotine, like she was saying, 
Yeah, it'll try to tempt you. That same spirit will tempt you to, to have that cigarette. If it was alcoholism, that spirit will attempt you to try to have another drink, but it's not a drive inside of you. See, it's not there anymore. It's just a thought. And so now that thought you can take authority over because you have a will and you can make a decision to uh, go along with that thought or to discard that thought and cover it with the blood of Jesus and say, you get out of here in Jesus' name. You do that a few times, that spirit won't tempt you anymore. It won't do it, all right, because you have taken authority over that. Now, let me give you a little story that we ran into about a little over a year ago of a man that we prayed deliverance for. He was an NFL football player. And uh, came through deliverance. He was, uh, he was even doing ministry at times on weekends. And, uh, and he had a call of God upon his life. But he had a problem in the perversion field. And... Uh, and so he couldn't, he couldn't get rid of it. He kept praying that God would set him free and God would do something in his life to get rid of that. But uh, it just couldn't, he just had such of a stronghold in him that uh, he couldn't deal with it himself, so he came in through deliverance. He had a problem picking up prostitutes. And uh, even though he had a beautiful wife and uh, a beautiful family, and so... Uh, he came in and God gloriously set him free. I mean, he came through and he was free. He was free. He, as a matter of fact, he would call me about maybe sometimes once a week. He did this for, um, I would say, uh, maybe seven or eight weeks. He would call and he said, Paul, I'm so thankful. I am so thankful for your ministry. He said, I am so free. He said, I, I absolutely... He said, I, that has no more effect upon my life. That stronghold is gone. He said, I'm having a beautiful relationship with my wife. And he said, uh, he said it's, just, it's just wonderful. And, uh, and he did this every day for a few weeks, like I was saying. And then uh, about the uh, seventh or eighth week, he called me back and he said, uh, Paul, uh, I need you to pray for me again. I said, what happened? He said, well, I uh, fell. I said, uh-oh, come on in. We got we got to go over this again, see. And so he comes in, and uh, we pray for him. God set him free again. He got free again. And uh, before he left, I said, "Let's have a talk." And uh, I said, "Tell me why you fell." And uh, and he says, "I work out downtown." And uh, he says, I go down Nebraska Avenue, and I go to work out, and then I come back the same way. And he said, as I would come down Nebraska Avenue, he says, I would see these uh, gals on the side of the street, and the saints would try to tempt me. And he says, it didn't even faze me for a while. It didn't faze me at all. And he says, I was able just to overcome those temptations, and uh, I felt real good about it. But then he said... Uh, all at once, he put something in front of me, that uh, person that I had been with before and I'd seen before, and, and the devil said, uh, wouldn't you like to be with her today? This is your day. And, uh, you know, he said, uh, I got to thinking about it. I got to thinking about that. And you, know, you know what this scripture I just read you says? It says you, uh, you, take, uh, you, you take authority and you, every thought... You take it into captivity, all right? So these thoughts were coming to him, and he was taking them into captivity for a while, all right? And so uh, he was getting rid of those thoughts. And then uh, on about the seventh or eighth day, see, the spirits may not give up for a while, you see? And uh, they'll try to come back. And he said, uh, then all at once, he said, uh, as a, a, the devil pointed this out to me, he says, I begin to think. And uh, he started doing a little feasibility study up here, okay? And uh, he said, I begin to imagine being with that person. And uh, then all at once he said, that imagination got the best of me. What does the Bible say right here? 
It says uh, you take that imagination and you pull it down. See, he didn't even do that. He, he, the imagination, if he would have pulled that imagination down, he still could have stayed free. But uh, he didn't keep it, he didn't pull it down because then he allowed that imagination to become what? A desire. And when you have a desire, the enemy knows he has already put a crack in your armor. All right? So now that crack is there, and he knows that he can just make another few more suggestions to you, and then all at once you will take action, and now you have the stronghold back. You see how it works? See, it's a battle of the mind, particularly after you've gone through deliverance. See, the stronghold is gone. So now uh, it's a process of the mind. It's a battle of the mind. And as you, as you begin to understand how the enemy works, when those thoughts appear in your mind, you say, you know, I know that thought's not from God, and God wouldn't be happy with me to do that sort of thing. So what do you need to do? You need to bind up that spirit in Jesus' name, and you pile the blood of Jesus upon it, and you say, you get out of here. You will not tempt me in Jesus' name. That's what Jesus did, see? And all at once it disappears, you see? And so don't even allow it to become an imagination. But we prayed for him, and God set him free, and I says, now let me give you a suggestion, a very strong suggestion. Don't go down Nebraska Avenue anymore. You go down 275. So, so what you don't do is don't put yourself in a position to where you had a weakness at one time. You see what I'm saying? Be, use some wisdom. And so you need to understand that, you know, you need time and space between a situation in your life so that, you, so that th that stronghold, as it has gone, then you can build up to where it, it won't even phase you after a while. But you, don't, you just don't go back in the same territory that you were once were, which created the stronghold to start with, you see. So, so you have to use wisdom with that. And uh, that way uh, you will see that uh, God, when he sets you free, you can stay free. And would you believe about a week and a half ago that this fellow has already moved now to another location? And, uh, and so I got a phone call on our recorder at the ministry building about a week and a half ago. And when he called, I wasn't there, so he left a, a message on a recorder. He said, well, he said, Paul, I just want you to know that I am completely free. He said, I have stayed free. He said, I am so thankful for you guys' ministry. And he said, it, he, said, I have, he said, I have not fallen since that last time. And he said, and I'm, I'm so strong in that field anymore. And he said, my ministry is soaring. And, he's, and so it's just wonderful to know that, you know, many times you just have to understand how the enemy works. And it's good to see people that just really go and, and strong for God. And, and you know what? That's what God's going to have you people doing here in this church. Yeah, you're going to get some attacks. You probably, some of you probably had more attacks in the last week and a half than you had before you got deliverance. See? But I'm going to tell you something. That's because you made the devil mad. That's all. He's just mad. He's mad because you got free. But, you, but I can tell you, now is your time to go on the offense. Now is your time to say, Satan... You have been destroying my life. Now I'm going to start destroying your kingdom in Jesus' name. And so you could do that. And you could do that when you understand who you are in Christ. God has given you all the tools that you need to work with to destroy his kingdom. And, and it's now it's time to do that. It's time to go into warfare. Go into warfare for what? Go into warfare for your family. Go into warfare for your neighbors. You go into warfare for your friends here at this church. And uh, so they also can get free. And so that their lives can be productive for Jesus. And I can tell you, God wants to use you. He loves you so much. And he knows that you see the power, the power of God is in your tongue. And when you start speaking forth with your tongue and you start claiming victory for you and your household, you're going to see things begin to happen for you. You're going to see prosperity come. You're going to see blessings come your way. Why? Because 
you believe them in your heart. You don't have that hindering spirit anymore. And you're confessing with your mouth. And with that confession, with your tongue, and you confess the Word of God, and you believe it in your heart, God says, I'll do anything for you. See? If you believe it. If you believe it. He'll, he'll give you everything you need. Everything. Ev- absolutely everything you need. Now, He may not give you everything you want, but He'll give you everything you need. And, and I can promise you, He will bless you. He will bless your family. He will bless your home. But you see, we just have to know how to come against His kingdom and take authority over Him so that He no longer has a right to affect your life. Now, let me give you a um, let me give you a story. And Matthew, first of all, I give you the scripture. Matthew sixteen, verse nineteen, and it says, "I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven." Let's go back to about the. Um, about the uh, eighth word in that little verse that I just gave you that's in my Bible. This is the New King James Version. It says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't say I'll give you the keys to the kingdom. He says I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. If he's given you the keys to the kingdom, he's giving you the keys to the door. All right? So you can just get inside. But if he gives you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, he's given you everything that heaven has to offer. Everything. Do you, know, you understand? That little word there means a lot. He, he's given you every single thing that heaven has to offer. Everything. Now, how many of you are willing to receive it? Now, I can tell you, when Paul says that he talks about the third heaven, he said, I saw things I can't even talk about. They were so awesome. Now, if he, there's a third heaven, there must be a one and a two, right? I, I believe that. And uh, I believe the first heaven has to do with this earth that we live in, what we see. I believe the second heaven has to do with the solar system. The third heaven is God's kingdom. Okay, that's above everything. Now, we know that Satan is a ruler of this world. He's a principality and power of the air. We know that. And uh, we know that God has given him that authority for a season. But he also has given us authority if we know Christ and the Spirit of God lives inside of us, he has given us authority over his kingdom. You understand that? We have authority over Satan in his kingdom. Now, a lot, of, a lot of Christians say that I believe that, but most of them don't believe it. They just say they believe it, but they really don't believe it because you can tell by the way they live, you see, and, uh, and by their actions. When they get an attack, they, uh, they, all at once they just uh, go crawl in a corner and, uh, and they just start feeling defeated because they got an attack, you know, and... Uh, now, that's not taking authority, not at all. If, if that's the way you're reacting, then I'm going to tell you one thing, then you don't understand what authority is. You get an attack, you start getting a headache, you start feeling bad, and you start coming against that in Jesus' name. Say, I bind you in Jesus' name. I take authority over you in Jesus' name. You will not, you have no right to my body in the name of Jesus. I bind you in Jesus' name. I just read a story about... Uh, Kenneth Hager just about two weeks ago, and, uh, and he was backing out of his driveway, and uh, a pain hit him in the back, top of his head back here, and, uh, and he said the first, he said it was so severe, he said he couldn't even drive the car. He said, I had to sit there in the driveway, and he said, I, my first, my first uh, uh, reaction was maybe I ought to call 911 or, uh, you know, and, and, and just uh, find out what's wrong with me. But he says, no, 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 no. He says, this is an attack of the devil. This is the devil attacking me. So he just sat there in his driveway. He said, you spirit in Jesus' name, I bind you. You will not, you will not stay in my head. You have no right to me. You spirit of pain in Jesus' name. I said, you leave me down in the name of Jesus. 
He said, pain, you come out of me right now in Jesus' name. I bind you and I break your power off of me. You have no right to my body. I'm a child of God. What are you doing in my body? You get out of here right now in Jesus' name. He carried on like that, he said, for 10 minutes. He said, you know what happened? Pain left him. What did he do? He went into warfare, all right? And he took authority and he bound up that spirit in Jesus' name. And you know, you have the same authority. God's no respecter of persons. You've got the power, power of God in you just like he does. And, and you can come against that in Jesus' name and because God wants you to use the authority he's given you. He wants you to do We had a lady come in and see us once that was a manager of a medical office over in, over in St. Peter. Uh, she was uh, having a lot of, she was having some emotional problems. She coming through deliverance, and, uh, but she was having a lot of problems in her office. And um, she said, if you can know if anybody's looking for a manager of a man, uh, but I said, well, why are you leaving? She said, well, I can't, can't handle the pressure. She said, there's, she said, everybody in that office is against me. And about me, there's accusation there that's not true. They're gossiping about me. And she said, uh, so much division, I, I just can't handle the pressure. And I says, well, well, well why, why don't you try something? Uh, take you to go to work every day. Oh, 15, 20, I said, well, uh, when you leave your house every morning, once you start binding up, you start binding up gossip and accusation and division and strife and that undercurrent spirit that's operating, that spirit of witchcraft that's going on in your office, once you start binding up, and uh, that's all I said. We about two weeks later, she comes back for the next appointment. And I said, uh, have you found a new job yet? She said, uh, and I said, uh, why is that? She said, well, she said, uh, I started doing what you talked about last time. I started buying, I start buying up these spirits and all these women. And she said, you know what happened? Every one of them. Not, not most of them. She said, every one, every single one of them has come back and apologized to me. And she said one lady left and went to work for another office, and she apologized. The patients are coming in, and they said, boy, it's awful, it's really peaceful in here. It didn't used to be like that. All because of one person started binding up the spirits. So you have authority to do that. You absolutely and I'll never, I'll never forget. We one time we went, uh, we had a lady that uh, was at McDill, and uh, she called Claire. One, day. she said, uh, you know, uh, she said, uh, I, uh, uh, why is that? Well, uh, I'm acting crazy. I'm, I'm passing out and doing things that's kind of goofy, and uh, see you. Well, Claire said, well, how long have you been doing that? Oh, about uh, three months. Well, what happened? Well, I don't really remember except, um, oh, yeah, I went to my grandmother's funeral. Oh, okay. Did your grandmother act crazy and pass out? Oh, she did all the time. Were you close to your grandmother? Oh, yeah, she raised me. Well, we knew exactly what her problem was. And so by the time she came in for her first appointment, and by the time she came to the second appointment, she couldn't even, she, 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 they, she'd already been admitted to uh, Charter Hospital. And so uh, uh, the uh, husband, he was devastated. He didn't know what to do. It was at Christmas time. And they had a little girl. And so uh, uh, we, we thought, well, we'll go see her at the, at the hospital. So we went over there. And we couldn't get from here to this wall from her. I mean, she'd see us, and she just took off running. And um, finally, we thought, well, we after about 40 minutes, we just kind of gave up and said, well, we'll come back. We'll try it tomorrow. And the next day, a Saturday, and we was ministering all day. So after we ministered, we said, let's go by and see if we can uh, uh, just pray with her, uh, whatever. And so we did. And what happened is she was on the bed completely out. And uh, he was there praying, her husband. And, uh, and we said, uh, how long has she been out? He says, well, she's been out since last night. 
You mean she's been out all night and all day today? He says, yeah. She said they gave her some. They they uh, had to give her some uh, uh, medication last night to settle her down. And uh, and he said that uh, they gave her too much. And uh, and so they said she's been out ever since. And I said, well, this must be God. That's the only way I can look at it. And I said, we're going to bind up those spirits in her, and uh, and we'll just uh, just let uh, let God just do a work in her life right here. And every time we'd bind up deaf and dumb, we bound up mental illness and insanity, and we started binding up these spirits that were in her. And every time we'd bind one up, her body would jump a little bit. And uh, but she was still out. Okay. Well, after about 15 or 20 minutes, we said, "Well, we think she, you know, she'll probably be all right, but uh, we haven't prayed deliverance for her yet. We just bound these things up so that she could get some relief, and uh, so she could get her homework done." And well, anyway, uh, this is what happened. The next morning, she gets up, she combs her hair, and completely sane. And uh, the staff, the people there, thought she was part of the staff. They thought, well, you know, they they didn't realize that she was a patient. They thought she was part of the staff. You know what? They stayed bound for a whole week. You know, sometimes they'll stay bound for a while. Sometimes they'll be longer. But uh, we we just really doing what we felt God wanted us to do. And uh, and then uh, we thought, well, if they'll let her out for at least uh, one day or leaving for three hours, we'll pray deliverance for her. You know, so we told her husband, and they wouldn't even let her out for Christmas Day. And so uh, we thought, well, I guess we'll just have to go back and, and minister to her at the hospital, which we don't normally like to do, uh, and so, but we did, and we prayed over the room, prayed over the door, with, so no nurse or no doctor, nobody would come through that room while we were praying deliverance, and uh, we told those spirits they could not make any noise, and they scooted her all over that place, and uh, two hours later, she was free, absolutely free, and, uh, but, but see, we had the power to bind and to lose. You have that. You have that. And uh, just to finish the story, uh, they had to fly her out the next day to uh, another hospital in Atlanta, Georgia, because she was part of the military to give her a test. And when they gave her the test, the guy came back and he said, somebody's made a big mistake here because uh, he said, you scored higher on this test than I do. And he said, there's not a thing wrong with you. She says, I know. She said, I'm a free person. And he just let her go back on home, see. And today they're in ministry at a, at a church here in this area and, uh, and just working with a, with a large church. And I can tell you, it, it, that's what God does, you see. That's what he'll do. But you have the authority to bind and to loose. You have that. And, uh, and God wants you to use that authority that you have. And, and I think maybe to explain the authority that you have to bind and loose, I'd like to tell you a little bit about a vision that a man had by the name of Jay Lee. Uh, he uh, was a friend of Frank Hammond. Frank Hammond has written a lot of books in spiritual warfare. And so uh, he uh, uh, had this particular vision, and uh, Frank printed it in one of his books. And it tells about the power that we have to bind and to loose. And this was a vision directly from God. And he said that they were in, he said the Lord took him in a place that uh, he thought possibly was, uh, uh, he said, I don't know where we were exactly, but maybe in, like in the second heaven. But he says we were in a chamber that was dimly lit. And uh, this chamber was narrow and long. And uh, he said in the center of this chamber or this room that we were in was a black table. And this black table was also narrow and long. And in the center of the table was a blue ball. Now, uh, he said, uh, we were standing at one end of the table, and uh, there at the other end of the table was a flame in the form of a man, and it had sparklers going off in it. And uh, on this side of the chamber were uh, flames that were about 8 and 10 feet tall, 4 or 5 feet apart, all the way up and down. He said it was a pretty long chamber. And he said, and on this side over here, that was the same thing. These, these flames were about 8 and 10 feet tall, 4 and 5 feet apart. And uh, he said, Lord, uh, where are we? Lord said, well, this is Satan's headquarters. And uh, he said, that uh, blue ball in the center of the earth, uh, in the center of that table, represents the earth. 
And that flame you see at the other end down there, that's Satan himself. He has these sparklers going off him because he likes to imitate God. And uh, he said now on this side uh, are some, some of his main spirits he's got in this room, and on this side is the same thing. And he said, you know, about that time, he said a bright light showed up behind him. He said he turned around and took a look. He said, man, I saw my angels. My angels, he said. And he said, they were in the form of a V, just like that. And I'm standing at the point of the V. The angels behind me lift the whole place up. And he said, uh, the Lord is standing beside me. Now, he said, we're standing in Satan's headquarters. But he said, can you imagine the boldness that I had? Man, he said, I had so much boldness. He said, I had my angels behind me. The Lord was right beside me. He says, when I saw that, he says, when I turned around, I just flung my arm like this, and I said, I bind you all up in Jesus' name. And he said, the most amazing thing happened. He said, gold chains went out of my fingertips. He said, you know what happened? It wrapped itself around every spirit in that room on the sides, those spirits, and even Satan himself. He said, it wrapped itself around every one of them. He said, you talk about Satan getting mad. Boy, did he get mad. He said, he looked at me, and he said, Mister, I'm going to tell you something. If you want to preach the gospel, I'll let you preach the gospel. If you want to be a missionary anywhere in the world, you can be a missionary. He said, I'll even let you feed the hungry if you want to. But he said, don't you ever do that thing again. Because he knew it destroys his kingdom. He said, at that, the Lord took him out of the chamber. And as he came out of the chamber, um, he said, we want to refield. He said, this field was so huge. He said, it was acres and acres and acres and acres. He said, we just kept going and going and going. He said, I have no idea how big it was. But he said, below us, on all, all these acres, he had looked below us, and he said, there were spirits that were all bound up, row upon row upon row. And he said, Lord, what in the world happened here? Lord said, oh, these are spirits that were one time very productive. But because the body of Christ has bound them up, they're still bound. See the authority you have? And he said, then, he said, we went to the end of that field. And as we went to the end of that field, it was like I was looking through this huge plate glass window. And as I was looking through this window, he said, I saw spirits binding up people. And... Uh, he said they were in so much bondage. They were just being all bound up. He said some of them looked like mummies. They had so much bondage wrapped around them, just all bound up. And then he said the Lord showed me another window over here. And I looked through that window, and he said there were more spirits binding up people over there. But he said, you know what? Didn't even phase them. Didn't phase them one bit. He said it was just like. Like hot butter, just roll right off of them. He said, had no effect on them at all. And, and he said, Lord, what am I looking at? Lord said, well, he said, these are all Christians, all of them. He, he said, these Christians over here, he said, you know what? They don't know who they are in Christ. They're the Christians that haven't been taught spiritual warfare. So they stay in bondage. Some of them are in so much bondage, they can't even hardly get back and forth to the church. They're in that much bondage. They're not productive. They can't be productive because they're in bondage. But he said, these people over here, they know who they are in Christ. And they know that they have authority to bind and to loose in my name. And he says, therefore, they will never be in bondage. But he said, then the Lord took him back into the chamber that he just left. And he said, this time as he was there, it was much brighter he was at the end of that table, and he saw Satan down there. And he said uh, he saw some little imps down there trying to knock those chains off of him he just put there. He said they couldn't even bulge him. He couldn't even bulge him. He said it, it had no effect on him at all. And he kept looking at him, and he says, man, he said he had a lot of chains on him. And uh, he said, Lord, uh, but he said, look to get. And he said, you know, he said some of them were rusting off of him. He said, Lord, why are those chains rusting off of him? He said, well, the Lord said, because the people that put them there lost their faith. See what your faith will do? You keep your faith. I'll tell you what, you'll be powerful in God's kingdom. And uh, 
he said they lost their faith and so they just rust off they're not effective anymore and then he said he noticed that uh, <clears throat> on this side here on all these spirits he said man these were big devils he said they're over there and all the way up and down this side and he said the only chains they had on them were the ones that he put on them no other chains he said lord why don't these spirits have a lot of chains on them like Satan has? Lord said, oh, these, are, uh, these represent the deceiving spirits that's in our churches today. He said, my people don't even have enough discernment to know they're even there. But he said, you know, we are in the last days. And I'm sending a gift, a gift of discerning of spirits to my people. And they will discern it. And they will bind them up in my name. And they will not be active in my body, in my, in my churches, in Jesus' name. You see the authority you have? You have that authority. God wants you to use it. He wants you to use it so you can be productive for his kingdom. I tell you, God honors faith. He honors faith and he honors authority. I can tell you, I, I'll never forget. One day, we were at Benny Hinn's church, and uh, we, were, uh, we were just listening to him preach a sermon. He said, uh, and he started talking about the power of binding and loosening. He said, you know, and if you, some of you read his book on uh, Good Morning, Holy Spirit, uh, you probably hear the story, but, uh, but you know, uh, he, uh, he said he prayed for years, years for his mom and dad. And he had a tremendous relationship with the Holy Spirit. When he was born again, he spent hours and hours and hours in his room just reading the Word of God and just worshiping the Lord. Just, and the Holy Spirit would come into his room, and it was so powerful that he, his brother said that, he said there was a crack under the door about that much. He said we'd get down and we'd look under that door, and he said all we could see was knees and, and the backs of his shoes. And he was there on his knees, just crying out to God, worshiping the Lord. And he said, he said, you could feel the power coming out of that room, just just from him spending time with the Lord. And uh, and he and he did that. And he'd have these services that were so awesome. People in the whole church would be slain in the spirit. And uh, we were in some a lot of those services that he had. But he said, you know, my mom and dad would not come to the Lord. One day he was praying. He says, God, I see all these miracles take place in these services. But you can't even save my mom and dad. What is going on? He said, the Lord just spoke to him. And so very calm. He says, well, I've done all I'm going to do. I did it all at Calvary. Why don't you do something? He says, he says, I've given you the authority to bind them up, bind up the devils in them. Why don't you do it? He said he never realized that the authority was there. He started doing that, and it wasn't, it wasn't just a few weeks that his mom came to the Lord. It wasn't too long after that his dad came to the Lord. You see, you have that authority. All you got to do is use it. All you got to do is use it. It's the God inside of you that has the power. But you need to exercise that power because if you will, then it builds faith inside of you. And the, when the more faith that you have inside of you, then God will let you have a little bit more of it. And then as you exercise that faith, then he'll give you a little bit more. And personal prophecy is in this case. ready to give you all the, the, all the anointing and all the power that you can handle. But uh, you have to step out in faith and see it happen in your life. It doesn't mean that you have to be a pastor. You don't have to be an evangelist. You can do it right there in your home. You can do it right there in your household. Benny Hinn was giving us a, uh, he was having a vision and giving us a prophecy. I'll never forget back, it's been 20, it's been 10 years ago or 12 years ago. And, uh, and as he was, as God was giving him a vision and a prophecy right in, right in the service, uh, he was showing him where he said that, uh, he said, I see an angel, an angel that's over this country. And he said, I see a river of blood going right through the middle of this country. 
And he says, I see that river of blood. And he says, because of the abortions that's been taking place in this country. And he said, uh, and he said, uh, and I see an angel that's ready to smite this nation because of the blood, innocent blood that's being shed. And uh, he said, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. He said, I see a little old lady. A little old lady that's holding up his arm so that he, that angel will not smite this nation. He said, some little old lady in her prayer closet that nobody knows about is keeping an angel from smiting this country. And, you know, that's how powerful that person's prayer was. Nobody knew who she was. And you see, so your prayers and the things that God has given you, it can be so mighty in God's kingdom. No matter who you are, where you live, God wants to use you. He wants to use you, every one of you. That's why I believe that God has, take, he has cleaned us up, and he wants us to be free so that you are now free to be mighty in his kingdom so his power can flow through your life. He wants his power to be manifested. He wants it to be manifested. He wants more power to flow through you than you can ever imagine. But he has to have a vessel to work with. And that vessel has to be clean and pure before God, you see. Because God's not going to let anybody take the glory. He's going to get all of the glory. And when he can find a vessel, that his glory will be given right back to him. I can tell you, you, see, you can see God use you in a way that you can't even believe. And I believe that God's going to use this church to be mighty in his kingdom and to be mighty to come against the demonic kingdom. But I can tell you what, you've got to work together and you've got to work in unity. And when you do that, you're going to see things happen here like you can't even believe. Because God wants this church, I believe he wants this church to be mighty in his kingdom. I really believe that. And, and, and when he attacks this church, don't, don't, don't start taking sides. No, 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 no. You get together and you start coming against that demonic spirit. You start coming against that thing that's trying to destroy because the devil's mad. And he'll, he'll want you to back off. That's why he's attacking you. Can't you understand that? You see, and when, but when you when you when you just come on with full force, I'll tell you what he'll take off with his tail between his legs, because he realizes that you know who you are in Christ, Amen. And so keep unity here, keep the authority inside of you, work together, and let and let this church be a powerhouse for God, Amen.